I'm Guy Hammond, the same guy from this movie, Finding Guy. If you haven't seen parts one and two, go back and watch those. And now, here's part three. The Christian group that invited me only had about 30 members, but the 200 seat auditorium was completely packed. The tension was so thick that when I began to go around the room to introduce myself to people, many would even shake my hand or look at me. As I gave my presentation, to my surprise, the audience was very respectful. But I could sense that I really wasn't winning anyone over. And I'll never forget this one woman who sat in the front row. She spent the whole two hours just staring me down. I mean, if looks could kill. And by the time I had finished my talk, I could feel the tension growing. So I quickly thanked the audience and walked away from the podium. And just then, someone stood up and shouted, we were told you'd be here till 9 o'clock, and it's only 8.30, and I have a question. I reluctantly turned around, went back to the podium, and answered her question. Then quickly, dozens of hands shot up. The room got louder. Some people started shouting. Some were booing. I could quickly see that I was losing control of the situation. So I just pointed at random to one of the hands at the back of the room. The woman stood up. She introduced herself as the president of the LGBT organization that had planned the protest. She said that she wasn't interested in becoming a Christian, but that she had never heard this side of Christianity before. She said that if my message was true, then it was a message that the whole world needed to hear. She then thanked me for coming and told everyone in her group to put their hands down. There was no longer any need to argue. And that was it. No disruption, no attack, no security needed. As the night came to a close, many of those who would not even shake my hand earlier came to meet me and share their stories. The lady with the big jacket also came up to me. And with tears streaming down her face, she gave me a big hug and thanked me. You see, there is a way for us to be able to dialogue about this issue, to reason with people, to treat people that we disagree with dignity, kindness, and respect. You see, you can't spend all your time telling everybody about how amazing Jesus is by telling them about everything that you're against. And I think one of the challenges is sometimes we're not convinced that Jesus is that amazing. We have to be convinced that Jesus changes lives. You know, how do we convince somebody to go from living a gay life and to considering Jesus? It's tough. You have to consider, we're asking people to leave a community that they feel very safe in to come and consider something that is very different to them. So another way of trying it would be following the example of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17. I don't judge you for the fact that you're involved in homosexuality. I don't judge you for that. You'd be a welcome guest at my church. I want you to come and learn. It's a safe place. We're going to give you time to figure things out. I'm going to be your friend. I'm going to care about you. I'm going to give you time and space to figure these very complex realities out in your life. Would you be willing to sit down with an open Bible once with me? Would you be willing to come to one church service? I'm not just asking you to change your whole life now, but I'm telling you, Jesus is way better than anything else. Would you be willing to give Jesus a try? You see, there's a way to be able to dialogue with people where we just don't knock everything we're against, but we actually spend our time lifting up Jesus and talking about how amazing Jesus is. We can't always tell people how amazing Jesus is by telling them everything that we are against. By 2011, Kathy and I were devoting 50 to 60 hours a week working for our church while simultaneously devoting another 50 to 60 hours a week running strength and weakness. We were also constantly receiving questions that we simply didn't know how to answer, like women's issues. We were living on such little sleep and on the verge of exhaustion. So we started praying and begging God to send people to help us. One of them was Morgan. I grew up in a Christian home that was built on the foundation of the Bible. Dysfunction was not something that I was very familiar with. I have two amazing parents who loved me unconditionally. It was at the age of 12 that I was introduced to homosexuality. 
This was introduced through a number of events, one being at a basketball camp, which resulted in a few relationships on my basketball team. It was then after that I entered college. I was playing Division I collegiate basketball and found myself in multiple relationships, sexually and emotionally with both men and women. This ended up in a whirlwind of confusion and despair. Confusion and despair, as you can imagine, led me to a terrible downfall. It was at that time that I started searching for God. I started looking into different churches in the community, and it was at that time that I found somebody who would study the Bible with me. And I remember the day of my baptism because my whole team, my coaching staff included, my entire new church community and my supportive parents were all there to watch me change my life from living an active lesbian lifestyle to now becoming a Christian. I, as a same-sex attracted woman, found love in a relationship with a man. I informed him of my struggle with same-sex attraction about six months into our dating relationship. And because of his faith in God, he loved me unconditionally and showed me so much compassion. Through the grace of God, I have peace and freedom in my struggle to really see Jesus through our marriage. A year after my baptism, Guy Hammond came to San Diego to speak at a conference. I pulled him aside, I told him my story, and he expressed the need for help in the women's ministry. And it was at that moment that I knew that God was calling me to help teach women and help them as well. There's also Steve and Deb Bowen who volunteered to run our family ministry. Neither one of their daughters are Christians, but here's what one of their daughters had to say. My name is Whitney Bowen. I have been with my wife for 10 years and we just got married six months ago. I am not a Christian nor do I prescribe to Guy Hammond's teachings per se. My parents are actually the leaders of the family and parent ministry for strength and weakness. And although we disagree in some fundamental areas, we can both agree that it is incredibly important for parents of gay children to have access to resources that allow them to keep their love door open. Because after all, they are your kids. For those who are struggling, I challenge you to love big, because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. I've also received help from some of the most unlikely places. For instance, my good friend Clyde, who's a gay man. And although we disagree on sexual ethics, he's decided to speak out in support of my ministry. A good friend of Guy. Yep. Been with same partner for 26 years. 26. I'm not a religious person, nor have I ever thought much of religion to be honest. How is it that you guys can be friends? Well, for me, the friendship outweighs any of the natives. And we can agree friends. to disagree. Yeah, that's right, and we're gonna get along. Yeah. But the truth is, most gay people are just regular folks. They, they want to... I'm at home, I'm a homemaker, I work. We are all human beings. Yes, you may not agree with my lifestyle. Well, let me say, I've never understood or heard of a same-sex attracted person before. I had no idea what that was. I always thought, if you're gay, you're gay. I've never thought of anything any different than that. But by meeting Guy, I can see that, yes, you can be that way. I'm not a religious person, but to see my friend have that much faith in his God to want to live that lifestyle is very powerful. Um, I'm not there yet. Maybe one day I will be there. Right now, I love my life. 26 years, same partner. Are either of you guys afraid of what people are gonna think of your friendship? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I'm with my friend. I'm grateful to God for how he's blessed strength and weakness over the years, but there's still a lot of work left to be done. As people continue to support the effort, we can bridge the gap between the LGBT community and Jesus' church. You know, all of us have legitimate needs. These are all given to us, they're inborn, and they're all real. But what ends up happening is that we, as we live our lives, Satan always is trying to sell us things to make us think that if you do A, B, or C, these things will meet your legitimate needs. 
But you know, these things don't work. But I believed the lie that said, guy, homosexuality is the thing that will provide these things for you. And again, this is not just a homosexual thing. People who are involved in heterosexual activity outside of the confines of a man and a woman bound together only in marriage, if you're trying to be able to take care of legitimate needs in that way, I'm telling you, you will be left sorely disappointed. It will not work. It tells us here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. What's an example of that? Well, I love to use this story here in John chapter 4 because I think it clearly demonstrates uh, a trap that we've all fallen into. This poor woman, you know, really had gotten her life into quite a mess. Jesus and the apostles come across her at a well. And the woman offers Jesus a drink. And Jesus says to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I don't have to keep getting thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, Well, go and call your husband and come back. And she said, Well, I have no husband. Jesus told her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you're with right now isn't your husband. What you've said is quite true. <laughs> Jesus is like, Yeah, you don't have a husband. You know what? This poor woman, she's done the same thing we've all done. You see, Satan's told her, if you have a relationship with this man here, it will meet all your needs. But it wasn't her husband. And so it worked for a little while, and then it didn't. So she had to go on to man number two. Then that worked for a little while, and then it didn't. Then she had to go on to man number three. And then that worked, but only for a little while. And then she went to man number four. And then man number five. Now she's with her sixth guy. Jesus is like, aren't you getting this yet? It doesn't work. Jesus says, I have a better way. You see, Satan is always trying to get us to try products that don't work. And then when we try it, he's like, I can't believe you tried that. Did you actually think that was going to work? You're crazy. We see this in products all the time. I mean, who doesn't love frosting? But do you know really what it is? Yeah. Three kinds of sugar with oil, with no strawberry inside. Come on, are you serious? What about the next one? No, it's just imitation boiled tree sap made from chemically processed corn kernels with water and aromatic compounds. Oh, you gotta love that. down what is going on it's orange juice you guys take your orange juice really seriously here in New York eh? wow that's incredible no come on let me tell you what the problem here is you see they try to sell us this product by telling us it's never from concentrate do you know what not from concentrate means it means that it's pasteurized and what happens when they pasteurize it they take all of the oxygen out of it and then they store it for like a year before it's bottled. And what ends up happening is when it's pasteurized and all the oxygen is taken out, it loses its orange color and it's not even orange anymore. And it loses its orange taste. They have to recolor it and re-put in flavor to make it taste good. I kid you not, Google it. It's the real deal, baby. Listen, companies do this all the time. They try to sell us one product, but really it's something di very different. But we drink it anyway. It tastes great. It takes away the thirst, but only for a little while, and then it stops working. And then you're thirsty again. Why are we talking about that? Because, you see, that's what happened to the woman in John chapter 4. It worked for a little while, and then it didn't. Then it worked for a little while, and then it didn't. Six times. Guy Hammond, hundreds of times, hundreds of men. It worked for a little while, but then it didn't. Then it worked for a little while, and then it didn't. You see, Jesus comes along to the woman at the well, and to you and I, he says, you know, I've got a better plan. With no chemicals. <laughs> I was in Chicago not too long ago, and I was talking about this, and I showed this, and a girl in the audience goes, excuse me, uh, 
water does have chemicals. I was like, okay, I know water has chemicals, but you get my point. Quit interrupting my lesson. Okay. It tastes great and no chemicals. You see, right, this is the difference between sin and Jesus. Sin, it's fun and enjoyable, but only for a short amount of time. Then it's full of pain and leads to spiritual death. But with Jesus, you get true fulfillment, forgiveness without pain, and it leads to eternal life. That's how it works. So are you a celebrity? Am I a celebrity? <laughs> well, the truth is, is that, uh, no, You're I'm not a celebrity, here. but this is a filmmaker who's making a movie about my life, and he follows me around everywhere I go. Well, then you got to be it's some kind of a celebrity a thing if, you're, if he's documenting your life. Isn't that crazy? By 2013, Strength and Weakness Ministries was helping thousands of Christian men and women in over 50 countries around the world. I had written a few books that people were actually buying, and several churches, faith-based groups, and universities from around the U.S. were inviting me to come and speak. And Kathy was also traveling with me and telling her side of the story to audiences. So at this point, it became clear that we needed to quit our full-time jobs as church leaders in order to devote all of our time to this ministry. It was a scary time, and it was an exciting time. We knew we wouldn't have a guaranteed income, and at that point we really had no funding nailed down. Uh, we really just had a website and a dream. One of the ministers in Canada, a, a good friend of ours, sat Guy down one day and was very concerned. He asked me, so you want to do this even though you're 50 years old? Guy said, yes. I'm married, you have a mortgage, a car payment, you'll have no regular income. Yeah. And you currently have zero donors. He said, are you crazy? <laughs> Look, I figured if it's the Lord's will, it's the Lord's bill. So we stepped out on faith and prayed that God would take care of us. And here we are, years later, living mostly off donations. It's been a fantastic journey, but it certainly hasn't been an easy one. Most people don't know that I'm actually a major introvert. Every time I stand in front of an audience, I feel like I'm going to throw up. And of course, since starting this ministry, I've found so many haters. I've been verbally attacked, laughed at, mocked, protested, threatened, lied about online and in the press. And deep down where no one else goes, I can tell you it's been both a humbling and a humiliating experience. I'll never forget the first email I ever got. It said, I hate you and your stupid, homophobic, bigoted ministry, and I know where to find you. <laughs> you know what? Bring it on. I'm not afraid of bullies and neither was my Lord. I'm not afraid to speak the facts. For example, in 2016, Johns Hopkins University, Bloomberg School of Public Health and Medicine, Arizona State University and the Mayo Clinic released a 143-page report stating that there is still no conclusive scientific evidence that genetics determines whether someone is born gay or straight. I'm open to the idea that one day they may find a gay gene, but again, for the Christian, I don't think it matters. Our ability to choose supersedes genetics, feelings, and emotions. I remember speaking at the University of Southern Maine where a gay rights group had printed t-shirts with the phrase, don't listen to Guy, and was passing them out to students to wear. Now, most students had no idea who Guy was and why they shouldn't listen to him, but hey, it was a free t-shirt. So I decided to turn that phrase into a marketing campaign for strength and weakness. I made a website called don'tlistentoguy.com. It's a place where people can gripe and complain and say whatever they hate about me. We've also printed our own line of Don't Listen to Guy t-shirts. You know, the truth is, 
I don't know exactly what I'm doing. I feel like I'm building the airplane while it's 40,000 feet in the air. We just finished speaking in our 30th city this year. Looks like we're gonna miss our connection in Washington and not get home till tomorrow. We're tired. Fortunately, we've only got one city left to go before Christmas. People ask us how Kathy and I are so happily married when I'm same-sex attracted and she's not. It's simple. We believe that love is best expressed when we focus on what we can give to one another rather than focusing on what we can get from one another. So over the past 25 years, I have just grown more and more in love with Guy. You know, he's always been thoughtful and funny and kind and generous. Uh, he values me as a woman. Uh, he values me as a wife. And I cannot imagine life being better with anyone but Guy. Well, love is relational. It's emotional, it's spiritual, it's not just physical. And through all of this, we've been able to enjoy life and raise our kids. <laughs> Wait. Did I even mention that we have kids? Yeah, we do. We have four. <laughs> Crazy, right? In 1993, we had our first daughter. Two years later, our son. And in 2006, the same year we started Strength and Weakness, we decided to adopt two more. <laughs> I love my kids with all my heart. My three oldest kids are growing now. And Kathy and I, with our youngest son, now live in a duplex house along with our lifelong friends, Mike and Barb. I'm reminded of my own parents. While they certainly suffered some difficult years in their marriage, I always knew they loved me. I'm also happy to say that they eventually did forgive one another. They remained married until my father passed away, and their final years together were relatively happy ones. While we live on this earth, we don't know what kinds of trials lay ahead of us, and many come without warning. We found out a few days ago that my wife Kathy has a brain tumor. The doctors are using language like stage four and end of life and we as a family are trusting God, but we're afraid. And I would like to offer this in closing. The Bible talks about pride, arrogance, self-righteousness, and judgmentalism over 900 times. It only talks about homosexuality in a direct way wow. only five times. Now I get it. You can't judge the importance of any topic based on how many times it's mentioned in Scripture. The truth is, if we only got one Scripture on being prideful and arrogant. It should be enough to cause us to be people who are humble. And if the Bible only talked about sexual ethics only one time, it should be enough to cause us to be people who are pure and righteous. That being said, I do think it's important to recognize that the score is 900 to 5. And maybe that reality should cause us to be people who should speak with some hesitancy on these issues that are this complex and difficult. Recognize we don't have all the answers maybe have a little bit more compassion and understanding, recognize that the ground truly is level at the foot of the cross. We truly are all the same and not just talk about how level it is.
Guy, I wrote down some thoughts I want to share with you. Honey, you're more than I could have asked for or imagined in a husband. Thank you for filling my life with laughter and joy and value. I want you to know that I'm at peace with God and His plan for my life. I do not fear the unknown. I'm not fully ready yet to let go of what we have, but I eagerly look forward to hearing God say, Well done, good and faithful servant. The best parts of this life have been finding God and finding Guy. You have impacted thousands of people around the world, and I'm honored to be a part of that. I hope you'll finish the work that God has laid out for you. With all my love, Kathy. Watching Kathy slowly slip away is one of the hardest things I've ever experienced. No, I'm not angry at God. He was the one who gave me my wife in the first place. And Kathy and I have always believed that our goal was to serve Jesus until he took us home and we heard those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. I recently traveled back to that fateful bus stop in Toronto. 30 years ago, my life changed forever on that one brief 20 minute bus ride. I got on that bus a homosexual. I got off that bus ready to live for Jesus. My call to everyone is, do whatever it takes to find Jesus. It won't be easy, but I can tell you Jesus is worth it. Everything else, and everyone else in this world will eventually let you down. He never will. And after a life devoted to finding God, I realize now that I was also finding myself. I don't know what God's plan is for me, but as Kathy said, I wanna finish the work that God has laid out for me. So until he takes me in another direction, I'm gonna keep on speaking. For now, I'll end my story with the words that I spoke at a Christian conference to an audience of over 15,000 people. I didn't have long to speak, so I just said a few things that were on my heart. There are thousands and thousands of Christian men and women who live with unwanted same-sex attractions. And we need your help. We need you to remind us that our value and worth to God and His church is not based on what we are attracted to. We need you to remind us that our identity is found only in Jesus and not in the badges that the world wishes to put on us. You know, for the young man we've been helping who lives in a West African country, who's too terrified to even tell anyone in his church that he's same-sex attracted because in his country, homosexuality is illegal. And so he's afraid that if he's open and transparent about this, not only will he ostracize the other Christians, but he might even be turned over to the authorities and arrested. I put before you, Jesus' church is not complete without him. For the young campus student I was speaking to just last week, who in tears was telling me how difficult it was because the world keeps calling out to him to embrace and celebrate homosexuality. But because of his reverence for the authority of the scriptures, refuses to. I put before you, Jesus' church is not complete without him. And for anyone in this arena, who's ever struggled with same-sex attractions from one degree to another, I want you to know, Jesus' church is not complete without you. And God is not ashamed or embarrassed of you. And He wants to use this area of struggle and weakness in your life to go and do something great for Him. Whether your same-sex attractions ever leave you or don't, don't use that as your measure of success. Succeed in loving God. Wait expectantly for the day you hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. 
Not perfect servants, but faithful servants. Now that is true success. Amen. Well, that's Finding Guy, the story of my life. It's been amazing working with Zach and Nate, the movie creators who also run this YouTube channel. Please consider supporting them at Patreon or their website so that you can help them advance this YouTube channel. If you'd like me or one of my staff to come and speak in your city, book us now at strengthandweakness.org. And if you want to purchase the movie to show at your church or group, go to the link in the description.